Let's apply what we've learned by doing a correlation analysis and creating scatter plots using JASP. For this example, we are using the jobsatisfaction.sav dataset. This dataset is available in our class, but also through a link in the description for this video. Put it on your desktop and let me show you how to open this in JASP. Now, the first thing that you will notice is that this jobsatisfaction.sav has a lovely icon attached to it. And you may see, especially if you're using a home computer, one that is not at a college or university, that your job satisfaction data set doesn't look like this. Well, why is that? If you do not have SPSS installed on your computer, you won't see this icon. SPSS is another different and also a very powerful statistical program. It's similar to JASP in some ways, different in other ways. And if you'd like to learn more about using SPSS, I know some videos you can watch. Anyway, back to this. Now, unlike Excel spreadsheets, JASP will open an SPSS or .sav dataset natively. So all you need to do is open up JASP and then go to the main menu. Open, computer, desktop. Click. Job satisfaction is right there on your desktop. So click open. And this will work regardless of whether you can see the icon. This imports the SPSS data into JASP. And now we're ready to get started. We can do a correlational analysis in JASP, but you need to know where to find it. It will be under the Regression tab. As we look at our options, we see the Regression tab right here to evaluate the association between variables. Under Classical, we can click on Correlation. All of the variables in our data set are in this first box. Some of them are scale level. We know that because it has the ruler next to it. Others are nominal level. The random ID number is a random identifier. It is nominal level because although it conveys information identifying, it doesn't have an underlying order or a scale. We will begin our correlation analysis by moving the variables into the variables box. I want to put in my predictor first, which is burnout. I'm going to use burnout to predict job satisfaction. I can click on the name of the variable and this arrow between to move it into the variables box. All right. I'm using burnout to predict job satisfaction, which means burnout is going to go on the x-axis. Job satisfaction is going to go on the y-axis. And I immediately get the progressive disclosure showing me a correlation matrix of these two variables. A good way to clean this up is to, under the additional options, choose display pairwise. It turns this more into a horizontal display. It removes some of the unnecessary blanks. You can see already that there is a strong negative correlation between burnout and job satisfaction. It is a negative 0.65, meaning that as burnout increases, job satisfaction decreases. And that should not come as a surprise. However, before I do anything else, I want to check the assumptions for these data points. I'm going to go down here to Assumptions Checks and twirl open this pane. I have options for checking multivariate normality and pairwise normality. I only have the two variables, so pairwise normality is going to be what I need. The assumption here is that the dependent variable, the one being predicted, job satisfaction, is normally distributed. So I'm going to check that out. Here's the Shapiro test. Here's my test for bivariate normality. And as any assumptions check, we want, we prefer that it be non-significant. Remember, this is a hypothesis test. We're testing whether the data are statistically significantly different than the assumption. If the p-value is less than 0.05 or 0.01, 
the data are different. Well, we don't want that. We want them to be the same as the assumption. We prefer that our assumptions checks be non-significant, meaning that the data match the assumptions. And in this case, they do. The non-significant p-value for Shapiro-Wilk tells you that the assumption of normality, bivariate normality, has been met. Now, I also have the option for multivariate normality with only two variables. What do you think that value will be? It's exactly the same. We have the same results because there's only two values. Multiple, uh, multivariate just doesn't uh, matter or work. It's not something we need for this. I'm going to unclick. Now, I want to leave this pairwise normality assumption checked because I want to be able to report the results of my assumptions checks. It's really important to check assumptions when you are doing any kind of hypothesis testing. But if you are doing a write-up, if you are submitting an article for publication, honestly, if you're doing it for a class, it's important to check your assumptions, but it's also important to let your reader know that you know what you're doing. And one way to indicate that is by doing the assumptions checks. They don't always get done, but they're really important. As a reviewer, when I get an article to read, I look for those assumptions checks. If the assumptions checks are included, I know this researcher knows what he or she is doing. And if the assumptions checks are not in there, I'm going to look a little more closely, be a little more suspicious. It's just the indicator when you include your assumptions checks in your write-ups that you know these steps and you're doing them properly. All right, back to work. We can improve our correlation output by flagging the significant correlations. With only one correlation between the two variables, it's pretty easy to see. However, if you're using multiple variables in your correlation matrix, flagging the significant correlations is going to make it easier to find them. Another thing we could include would be the confidence intervals around this correlation. These confidence intervals around a correlation work the same way as they would as confidence intervals around a mean. Both of them are negative, which is going to tell me that this uh, p-value, it's going to tell me exactly what this p-value says. These are statistically significant. Uh, but it also tells me that the true correlation in the population would be between negative 0.56 and negative 0.72 about 95% of the time. We're rerunning these data points. Another thing to get is the sample size. It tells me how many pairs there are. So sample size and correlation is the number of pairs, not the number of individual data points. So if there are 200 people, we have 200 pairs. That's my total sample size. And if I might digress for a moment, the JASP development team is excellent about adding new functionality, especially when users request something new. And a few years back, I was using SPSS and transferring my class materials from SPSS to JASP. And I noticed that JASP did not include the sample size. And so I wrote to the team and I got a lovely email back from Jan who said that including sample size is really important. It's something that was included in the SPSS output and it ought to be in JASP and the next iteration of JASP, it included sample size. So every time I do a correlation and get a sample size, I have a little warm feeling like that's part of my contribution to science. Sample sizes in JASP. All right, enough of that. Let's get back to work. So the next thing that we're going to need to do is to create a scatter plot and that's going to be really simple to do. I go to the plots and click on scatter plot. And there it is. One great thing about JASP is that although it creates these plots automatically, I can resize, make them look a little better. I, I like the, uh, the extra space that's available when I enlarge the scatter plot. And of course, I can copy this scatter plot and paste it into Microsoft Excel if I wanted to use it. And this is a pretty nicely formatted scatter plot. Unlike Excel, where I needed to do a great deal of editing, this scatter plot, ready for publication. I could drop it into a publication just as it is. While we're here, let me show you a few of the other options that are available for correlation. We'll learn more about non-parametric statistics later, 
But there is a non-parametric alternative to Pearson's correlation, which is called Spearman's row. I'll just click on that. It's going to give me a Spearman correlation and a Pearson correlation, noting that the Spearman's row is almost exactly the same as Pearson's correlation. That's because these data meet the assumptions for doing a Pearson correlation. So Spearman is not going to differ very much at all. Kindle's tau is another option, which actually wouldn't apply for this particular data set. In fact, let me show you one other thing while we have this data set open. I'm going to grab a few more variables and uh, just drop those in. Uh, age, put that in there. I'll, I'll leave that for later. Um, here are these multiple scatter plots. Let's not use those. What I want to show you is down here under options. See, so remember when we talked about multivariate normality and the assumptions checks? Let me show you what we do when we have these multiple variables in a correlation. Remember, correlation is only two variables at a time, but we can drop multiple variables into a correlation matrix where each variable is being correlated against the other. The first thing that I would like to do is change this display into a correlation matrix, which I can do by unchecking display pairwise. There's the matrix where every variable is correlated against every other variable. And you can see now how flagging significant correlations makes those easier to find among these data points. And in addition to scatter plots, or rather in place of scatter plots, use a heat map. The heat map uses color of varying degrees or darknesses uh, that indicate the strength of the correlation. So for instance, we have a really strong correlation between turnover intention and job satisfaction. Uh, it's a strong negative correlation. As job satisfaction increases, turnover intention decreases. As the colors are lighter, let's say between age and job satisfaction, or um, what would be another example? Here's uh, compassion satisfaction and job satisfaction. Actually, that's actually a pretty, pretty good correlation, 4-8. Uh, so I'll just use this example, this lighter uh, bluish gray color. Uh, there's a slight positive correlation between age and job satisfaction, but I can also get a sense for looking at age with these other variables. Uh, slight negative correlation with compassion fatigue, a little stronger negative correlation with turnover intention, a little stronger uh, with burnout. So what we see is that age increases. Generally, you're more satisfied with your job. Or maybe uh, the reason you've stayed with this job so long is because you found one that suits you and you're pretty good at. Compassion satisfaction is higher based upon age. So we're seeing some kind of relationship between age and these other variables. But I can use this heat map to map out the strength of the correlations. And because we have flagged the significant correlations, we also see that appearing. Let me check and just see. I don't know if this does work, but if I uncheck, yeah. If I uncheck flag significant correlations, then they're not flagged in the heat map either. And because I told you about multivariate normality previously, let me show you where we'd find that. I can find my multivariate normality check here under assumptions checks. Click on Shapiro. All right, here's my multivariate normality. And here are all of the bivariate normality statistics. What you'll notice is that when we look at the bivariate normality, there are several examples where certain variables uh, violate the assumption of bivariate normality. However, when we look at the whole model, the Shapiro-Wilk test is still non-significant meaning that I could reasonably drop these variables into a single model and I have not violated multivariate normality. Uh, it may be important still to look at the bivariate normality for specific examples within that. And that is a much deeper dive into how to use correlation, scatter plots, heat maps, tests of normality within JASP.